know, I know some of you are interested in anarchy from um, just from our breakout discussion groups. And the first thing that I want to do, I've called it anarchy instead of self-governance. And as I'm sure you're already all aware, anarchy is not synonymous with chaos, which is unfortunately one of the one, along with no government, there is a, a dictionary entry that uh, that refers to it as chaotic. Of course, I'm sure all of you are aware that, that that's not true. Uh, anarchy can can mean something more than that. In fact, what it really means, right, is or what it may mean, is a simply a different system, a different way of providing rules of social order. So you can think about the, bro the kind of in broad terms, the problem situation that we confront, whether it's in everyday interactions um, or in those that are not so everyday, as presenting various potential for conflict, whether it's cheating by some individuals um, or other forms of opportunistic behavior. That ultimately is the social dilemma. That's what Hobbes was talking about, right? That's the fundamental problem that economists need to come to grips with, is how is it that we're going to overcome these potential situations of conflict and convert them instead into situations of cooperation. That's where wealth comes from. Now, historically, one way of trying to create cooperation from situations that might otherwise pose threats of conflict, one way of doing that, and the way that has gotten the most press is through a state, through government. And that is, again, that's one way that's certainly possible. And we're going to Hopefully, I'll talk here uh, in a little bit about comparing and contrasting that against another alternative that I want to put forward. But government is just one way of providing rules of social order that align incentives and get individuals to behave cooperatively to overcome those situations of conflict. The other way, which is more broader, it's not really the other way, it's actually the broader, um, the broader idea within which government falls is the idea of governance. Governance simply refers, so distinguishing government and governance. Governance refers to some system of rules, some system of law, if you want to think about it that way, and means of enforcement of those rules or laws as a way of facilitating social order. So within government, I should have started it this way, within governance... and enforcement, you have government and you have private ordering. Now, this is something that I was just talking with Pete about a moment ago, but within private ordering, you can think about spontaneous, spontaneously emergent rules that, prov that govern our interactions, and you can think about rationally constructed rules but we're just going to focus on what we call private ordering versus government for the time being. What's the classic definition of government? I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Who wants to volunteer it? Comes from Weber. There's a hint. Yes? Monopoly on violence. A monopoly on violence. We might even append it a little bit and say it's not just a monopoly on violence. It's a legitimized, not legitimate. That's a different thing for those of you who care about ethics. right? It's a legitimized monopoly on the use of force in a given territorial region. It's one specific mechanism or means, institution of producing order. Private ordering is distinguished from government in the sense that it does not involve a monopoly. It's competitive in some sense. Now, I don't know if we're going to, I don't think maybe in the Q&A, we won't have time to talk about this now, but normally we talk about these two things as though they're completely separate categories. In fact, there's something like a continuum. It's not exactly obvious where private ordering begins and where government begins. Would you consider a mafia group a government? I don't think most of us would. But what if in a three block radius, that mafia group has a monopoly on force? It's able to extort and control and protect and do all the things, even in some cases provide public goods, that we think a government does. Does that count as a government or not? Well, it depends on the range in which we define potential competitors. The government is one competitor, 
other potential mafia groups that might move in or other competitors. So if you define the market broadly enough, then in fact that mafia group is not a monopoly provider. But if you restrict the territory to which you're considering to the three block radius, and it's the only one that exists, then it is a monopoly provider. It seems to me that there's something fundamental about the mafia, which makes us think that's not really a government, even though it might provide governance functions, which distinguishes it from a state. And it's not just scale. Part of it is this idea of legitimized. Most people don't think of the mafia's control over the area that it controls as legitimized. We do tend to think of what the state controls as legitimized. Well, maybe not people in this room, but people outside this room. So there's a continuum, but we're going to ignore that and pretend for the moment that there's a clean, a clean distinction. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is to convince you a little bit about the importance of anarchy. There are some people who think that studying stateless order, some Austrian types, in fact, who think that studying stateless order is a kind of luxury. It's not really central to what Austrian economics is about. It's not really central to what economics is even about. It's kind of a sideshow that a few crazy people want to talk about. I don't want to say those people aren't crazy. I count myself as crazy. Uh, but I do want to emphasize or attempt to persuade you of the fact that this is not a sideshow enterprise. It's critically important not only to this understanding of economics, but it's critically important to Austrian economics. And the first way that I want to try and, as a way of introducing this to, is to point to the fact that even though we live in a world with many governments, most of our interactions are, take place in the context of anarchy. They are anarchic. Most of the world, for most of its history, so going back in time, has not had things like the way that we recognize Western governments. Governments that are strong enough to collect taxes even to enforce their will on their citizens. Historically, that hasn't been true. Government, as we understand it, is a relatively recent phenomenon. It's a new invention. So one thing that you might wonder about is, well, hell, historically, how is it then that people were able to overcome situations of conflict and facilitate social cooperation? We know the world existed before the mid-19th century, before the rise of the nation state. How is it that people were able to get along? Anarchy is one way of understanding all of history, the bulk of it, not just this narrow slice in which we live. Second, and this one is very important, and Richard, this goes, hope all of this is partly in response to the question that you asked the other day, but I'm sure you'll have follow-ups. The other thing to think about is that even today, this is really important, most of the world's governments are what are classified as either weak or failed. Which means that their governments either are not strong enough or are unwilling to provide protection, the basic services we expect of a state, to their citizens. Or they are almost unable to do so. They are on the cusp of that. This is not my definition. This is not, in fact, even the definition of a group of libertarians. Nor is it even the definition of a group of economists. The people who have created this metric, which is relatively recent, and is very important for those of you who are interested in empirical work, comes from the Fund for Peace and Foreign Policy, two widely respected organizations, political science type oriented organizations. And they're the ones who classify countries in the world. And they classify them a bunch to, according to a, a bunch of uh, criteria. And according to them, if you count them up, more than 50% of the world's governments are in this place. They hang on only by a thread. They're barely able to do anything. Now, much of that world, as I talked about in my development lecture, are poor. Many of those countries are poor. Not all of them are extremely poor, but many of them are. Still, despite that poverty, they subsist, and in some cases they even grow. How is that possible in the absence of government? If you're interested in understanding the way that most of the world's population lives, then you have to understand anarchy, because most of them live in effective anarchy. If you have an institution that calls itself a state, but it is incapable or unwilling to protect you, to perform the basic functions of government, then you do not have a functional government. Something other than the state must be producing social order to the extent that it exists in these places. So not only if you want to understand the bulk of history, you need to understand anarchy, but if you want to understand the bulk of the world we live in, you want to understand anarchy. Further, third arena, 
the international arena. We live in a world, as I, as I mentioned before, of multiple governments. We don't have one world state, much to some individual's chagrin. There is no formal supranational sovereign with the power to enforce contracts or the power to promulgate and enforce criminal laws. We have a whole bunch of different sovereigns. So how is it then that individuals from those different sovereigns and the political rulers that in fact make up those different sovereigns interact? Who, inf who creates rules that govern their interactions? And who enforces the rules that govern their interactions? Where does that come from? The world exists in an arena of anarchy, just from the simple perspective of states. Something I'll talk about more in a little bit. Perhaps the most important way to, to do a little foreshadowing to think about this is that one quarter, currently, one quarter of the world's wealth, one quarter of world GDP, is generated by international trade. Who enforces those international commercial agreements? These are just contracts created between international parties. Someone from the United States and someone from Switzerland. The US government does not enforce those. Nor does the Swiss government. So where does the enforcement come from? How is it that people aren't constantly cheating each other? How do they have the trust to be able to enter into these interactions and realize the gains from exchange and in doing so produce wealth for the world? Again, one quarter of the world's wealth being produced this way. Fourth arena of everyday anarchy. The world in which you live, and this is the sort of one of the first comments that I made. Even in countries, go domestic, no more international, and go to a country such as the United States where the government is highly effective and functional. Even if we have problems with it, compared to the rest of the world, it's highly effective and functional. Even in that context, even in our context, there are pockets of anarchy. One important pocket of anarchy, which actually includes a bunch of sub-pockets, is criminal activity, which even in a place like the United States does not constitute a trivial percentage of our GDP. Prostitution, illegal drugs, even legitimate industries in which there is black market or gray market activity, operations under the table. Those things can't, by definition, be enforced by the state. They're illegal. You can't go to the neighborhood policeman and tell him that the crack dealer ripped you off. That doesn't work. So why is it that the crack dealer doesn't rip you off? How do you enforce those exchanges? How do you encourage cooperation in an environment, even in a developed country, where government can't oversee the interactions? Furthermore, something that I'm going to talk about in just a second. The fact that, oh, this is what I just talked about a moment ago, the fact that oftentimes using state enforcement means, going to a court, suing somebody, is prohibitively expensive, means that in fact, although officially state enforcement exists, effectively it does not. If it costs more, to enforce your contract than you can hope to get when the contract, even if the, the judge decides in your favor, then effectively government courts are not, in effect, are not a way in which you can have your agreement enforced. That exists even in the developed world. Okay. I already mentioned a little bit about sideshow versus necessity, but I want to root it specifically in Austrian thinking, which is appropriate for our group here. And I want to point first to a quote, or a part of a quote, from Mises on Menger's theory of money. Mises refers to Menger's theory of money as, quintessential, as a quintessentially praxeological theory, and he pointed in this quote to its, quote, import for the elucidation of the fundamental principles of praxeology and its methods of research. Hayek, uh, Hayek, Mises specifically points to this theory as being the kind of archetype case for research in Austrian economics for the elucidation of the program of practicology. Why does he do that? He could have pointed to lots of stuff. But one thing that we know, one interesting thing about him pointing to this, is the fact that Menger's theory of money is a theory, of course, of spontaneous order. It's a theory of privately created order, right? It's not about government creating, it's about private individuals, each pursuing their own self-interest, leading, unwittingly in this case, to the emergence of a social institution that provides order and facilitates social cooperation, enabling individuals to realize the gains from exchange. 
Coordination without command. For Mises, at least, that's the quint that's a quintessential that's the quintessential praxis logic. So, I, in my opinion, there are three reasons that he emphasizes this theory. He singles it out. The first is that it focuses on human purposiveness. You're all familiar with the axiom of action, which Mises defines as purposeful behavior. The theory of private ordering, the theory of spontaneous order, is rooted in the idea of human purposiveness, which Mises wants to emphasize. Second, and critically, perhaps most importantly, it is a theory of social cooperation. As I mentioned a moment ago, it's a theory about individuals behaving purposively on their own, privately, and in doing so, creating institutions, which is our third bit here, that promote social cooperation. Provide rules of order, meta-rules, that facilitate our interactions. Instead of allowing our, in our interactions to degenerate into a Hobbesian scenario of conflict, <coughs> these individual purposive behaviors give rise to institutions that promote our ability to cooperate and thus to become wealthy. Really these things are, and Pete mentioned this yesterday in the roundtable discussion, these ideas come out most explicitly in Mises' elucidation of what he calls the Ricardian Law of Association, which we, or modern economists, typically think of in terms of comparative advantage. That's Ricardo's law. But really, what Mises points out is that that idea is much, much broader. It's really the idea, the broader idea about gains from exchange and the ability to socially cooperate. Right? For Mises, social cooperation is at the foundation of civilization, the foundation of wealth creation. Hence the Austrian emphasis on how it is that institutions either facilitate or undermine individuals' ability to cooperate for that purpose. That's what the Ricardian Law of Association is about. In my opinion, that's fundamentally what Austrian economics is about. And that is why Austrian economics, first and foremost, or at least centrally, is concerned with understanding how it is that private order can emerge. Okay, that's my little sell on why I think this is important. So now I want to talk specifically about anarchy. And the way that I think about it, and the way, at least for this discussion, the way I'd like us, I want to encourage us to think about it, is to think about anarchy in terms of three cases. The first is what I call the easy case. And the easy case considers how it is that self-government, private order, right, private governance, it exists and can function or can't function. It's an, it's an investigation, right? We don't know a priori. In the state's shadow. Who's heard the phrase the state's shadow before? Only a couple people. Normally, if you're arguing anarchy with other people, right, other economists, this is what they'll point to. Right? What they'll say is something like, well, look, I agree there are pockets of anarchy even in developed countries. These criminal, criminal enterprises, for example, being at the foremost in our minds at the moment. Sure, you know, when the government basically provides a whole bunch of, of meta rules, laws and institutions of enforcement, we can imagine people producing self-enforcing contracts, something I'm going to talk about in a moment, and that can exist because you have the basic infrastructure being provided by the state, you just have individuals off to the side kind of doing their own thing. If those things fail, if the crack guy, if the crack dealer stabs you, you can and probably will go to the state and say, that guy stabbed me, can the police track him down and somehow enforce the punishment? And that creates social cooperation. So the easy case is going, which I'm going to consider, I'm going to go through each one of these after I lay them out for you. The easy case considers the possibility of self-government when the state exists, it casts its shadow over those anarchic interactions and kind of acts as a backdrop, a last resort means of enforcement and producer of social rules. In the economics literature, the conventional wisdom is that this is certainly possible. There's a large and growing literature on self-enforcing contracts. You don't actually always need, in fact, in many cases you don't need, any state or any third party at all, it turns out, to enforce the contracts, even when they involve massive amounts of money, with the people that you contract with. Those things can be self-enforcing in ways that I'm going to talk about in a minute. The second case 
of anarchy that I want, to, I want us to think about is what I call the hard case. And this considers the possibility of self-government functioning effectively outside the state's shadow. This would be a case in which government does not set of rules. There is no state as a backdrop. Think about the developing world, for example. The government either doesn't exist or is so dysfunctional that you can't rely on it. So even in your non-criminal commercial interactions, for example, if somebody cheats you, you can't then go to the government court to have that agreement enforced. That's the hard case. How is it that we can have the possibility of effective anarchy, effective self-government, outside the state's shadow? And the conventional wisdom here is that this generally does not work. It's not possible. The reason that it's not possible, and I'm going to elaborate these in a moment, is that when populations are large, a, lot of number of, a large number of people, and those populations are diverse, people have different ideas, they come from different backgrounds, there are different ethnicities, they speak different languages, that self-government tends to break down. If you don't have a shadow of the state, and you've got a large number of people who are different from each other, self-government doesn't, self-governance doesn't work. Also, if you have the possibility of violence, so far my remarks focused on the idea of what we might call peaceful theft. There's two different ty types of theft that I should distinguish here. The first is you create a commercial contract with some other party, and he or she defaults on it. That's one type of conflict. That's peaceful theft. The person cheated you, but their ability to cheat you stems from the fact that they exercised more leverage in the, in, the negoti in the contract. For example, in a credit agreement where somebody agrees to give you money and you repay them later. Well, once you have the money, what ensures that you're going to pay it back if there's no government? You can cheat them. That's a form of peaceful theft. But there's another form of theft that we need to deal with, and that is violence. What if some guys are stronger than other guys, and therefore... Rather than just entering contracts with you and defrauding you, people come up to you, wallop you on the head with a stick if they're stronger, and take the money that you have. That's another type of potential conflict that we need to confront. And what the conventional wisdom in the literature says is that not only if the population of individuals in question are numerous and socially different, but if some of them are substantially stronger than others and can do this clubbing action, also self-governance does not work. The hardest case of anarchy that we're going to consider is the possibility of self-governance, a system of completely privately ordered rules that generates wealth, a level of standard of living that is as large or even larger than that that is enabled by state-governed societies. Does that make sense to everyone? That's the hardest case for reasons that I'm going to discuss, but that's the thing that often comes up. Again, those of you who discuss with your friends or other economists about these things, right? Even if they say, okay, sure, you can have self-enforcing contracts and the government exists, and even if you can convince them that, okay, even when the government doesn't exist, rules can emerge and be privately enforced, their response is, okay, it can, it can, it can exist, but that doesn't mean that it's as good or better than the alternative, which is to have the government do those things. This is an efficiency claim. Just because private markets can facilitate social cooperation doesn't mean that government isn't better at doing that thing. We recognize, most people in this room presumably think, that markets do most things better than government. Although I would wager that a substantial proportion of you think that government does at least a few things better than markets. National defense is an example that often comes up. Probably some of you include police or courts, basic institutions of social order. I want to challenge that idea, or at least investigate this a bit with you. But that's the hardest case. Basically, everybody thinks this is impossible. Just like most people think that you're not going to be able to have effective self-governance outside the state's shadow, most people think that it's certainly not true. That even if you can get that, that it's going to be self-governance is going to be able to produce a level of wealth equivalent or greater than what the state produces. Okay, so now I want to walk through each of the cases. Starting with the easy case. The best example 
of self-enforcement in the shadow of the state that I alluded to before is self-enforcing contracts. How many of you have gone to a restaurant and gotten either the wrong thing served to you or a meal or drink or whatever it was that was of crappy quality relative to what you thought you were contracting for? Raise your hand. Pretty much everybody has. Among all of you who raised your hands, how many, you, how many of you have then sued the restaurateur for that contractual breach? Nobody has. Well, this should pose a question in your mind. If none of you are taking to task through our official legal system, the restaurateur, why doesn't he always cheat you? You order a filet mignon, he throws a flank steak at you. That's cost cutting for him, right? That's more money in his pocket. He charged you for the filet. He knows, based if he's ever asked anybody, or if he has common sense, he realizes that, like all of you, none of you have actually ever tried to sue him for doing that. So why is it, why is it not in his interest to always have you order the filet and then throw the flank steak at you? You won't come back. Boycott. Right? There are two types of boycott. We'll call them unilateral punishment and multilateral punishment. If he gives you the flank steak and you order the filet, right, you don't go back, and why does that punish him? Profits go down. If he expected that you were going to be a repeat patron, right, then his future income stream is reduced by virtue of the fact that you refuse to go to him in the future. And there's a norm that exists he realizes that even if you are not going to sue him, you won't go there anymore. There's a way you can strengthen this punishment to make it multilateral. And what is that? I'm sure you've done this before. Tell your, Tell your friends, right? <laughs> Spread the word. Now you get a whole bunch of people who cut this guy off from your income. His reputation suffers. That is a classic example of a self-enforcing contract. That I want to suggest to you, by the way, is the fashion in which the overwhelming majority of your interactions, not just restaurants, in fact, not even in your business interactions, but also with your friends, socially, that you enforce rules, even when they're unwritten, to make sure that people cooperate with you instead of cheat you. The threat of ostracism or boycott, it's os we call it ostracism in a social context. We have an unwritten rule, a norm, that says we like it when you smell good. Or at least, we don't like it when you smell horrible. What ensures, what enforces that social rule? You boycott people, you ostracize them when they reek. I don't want to hang out with Charlie. Smells like he hasn't had a bath in a while. You gossip among your friends. This is the socially productive aspect of gossip. We often malign gossip, but we shouldn't. It's actually very effective. Okay. That's a basic form of a self-enforcing contract. That idea about reputation and the ability to punish people by refusing to patronize them again, socially or commercially, can discipline their behavior. The economic theory on which that is based is what's called the folk theorem. How many of you have heard of the folk theorem before? Almost nobody's heard of the folk theorem. The folk theorem basically says the following. That when interaction between individuals is infinitely repeated, or what is equivalent, when, it, when that interaction terminates with some constant unknown probability, that the shadow of the future, the specter of being cut off from stuff down the road, which is more valuable than the one shot gained from cheating today, can cause you to cooperate today. That's the basic idea of it. I'm going to categorize this mechanism, we'll call it the folk theorem mechanism, as unsophisticated. I don't mean that in a normative way, I just want to distinguish it from other mechanisms that we're going to talk about. It's unsophisticated in the sense that it's extraordinarily simple, it happens all the time, and there's nothing magical about it. This is common sense. It's common sense except, by the way, to people who think that government is necessary to enforce contracts. Overwhelmingly, government is not necessary to enforce contracts. And if you look to the real world, if you open your eyes, right? And look around at what's actually happening. You realize that this is what's governing most of your interactions. A few not so everyday examples, probably for people in this room, that I pointed to are Jewish diamond traders. Lisa Bernstein has an excellent paper that was published in the Journal of Legal Studies in 1992 called Extra Legal Contract Enforcement in the Diamond Industry. And what she pointed to was 
There are some industries, the diamond industry being one, which is kind of a, an interesting case, right? Because diamonds are worth a lot. They're also really, really tiny, therefore easy to steal. And they're light, which means that it's cheap to transport them if you steal. In many ways, diamonds are a kind of quintessential example of a good that you would expect lots of cheating, opportunism to exist over. And yet, this industry, this precise industry, is one in which nobody at all relies on government enforcement. Instead, most of these contracts, I don't know how many of you have ever observed any, anybody know any diamond dealers? Have they observed it? Have you ever noticed how they walk in? One of my friends, his father is a diamond dealer in Chicago. And with the people, I, would, I loved watching it, it was fascinating. The people would come in, right? These are oftentimes people that he didn't know, at least at first. And they would have these, these little white packets that are completely unmarked, folded up with a bunch of diamonds in them. And they're throwing them around like they're candy. And nobody knows what the hell, the things are passing back and forth. The guy's got a loop in his eye, he looks ridiculous. I mean, the, it's a whole show. And I always thought, gee, anybody with a brain in their head could easily pocket some of these things. And I said to him, what's going on with this? And he says, if that guy cheated me, I said, how do you know he's not throwing pieces of glass? He could throw pieces of glass at you, because oftentimes they're not even checked. He could leave and never see you again. And he says, look, first of all, to get into this industry, which is a mechanism I'm going to talk about in a bit, you have to kind of establish, you have to signal the fact that you're likely to be in this industry for a long time that you're a repeat player. Somebody has to vouch for you to get in. It's kind of like in the Mafia. Another case, by the way, in which government can enforce contracts. There's a commonality there and there's a reason for that. Reputation is coming to play and you can only have a reputation at first if someone doesn't know you, if another person vouches for who you are. He says, if somebody cheats me, and I said, has anybody cheated you? He said, I had a guy cheat me once. And I said, what happened to that guy? Did you, you know, I said, how much was it? He told me it was a few hundred thousand dollars. It's a lot of money. This guy has a small shop. I said, what'd you do? You know, did you, you socked it to him, you took him to the courts. No, he's like you at the restaurant. He said, no, I spread the word that this guy was a jackass and a charlatan, and nobody ever dealt with him again. He's like, he's been purged from the industry. Reputation. Another example is a book by Robert Ellison called Order Without Law. He's a law professor at Yale. The subtitle is How Neighbors Settle Disputes. He considers ranchers in Shasta County, California. And what he documents, which I'm not going to go to in detail, but what he documents is that this ra these ranchers, large numbers of communities of these ranchers, interact with cattle and all sorts of other stuff, agricultural products, kind of like the diamond traders in the sense that they never resort to government. In fact, there's a norm in this community. You're actually ostracized in this community if you try and use government. Apparently the cowboys don't like that. He goes into detail about a whole bunch of different ways in which they enforce various agreements between these cattle ranchers. Again, this is happening in the world right now in which we live, but ultimately they come down to, if you strip them of all of their detail, this reputation mechanism, this folk theorem idea that I pointed to before. The idea of reputation and cutting off people who are cheaters, which damages their reputation and therefore damages their prospects for making money in the future. Okay, this is great, but there are some rather severe limits on how far we can take the reputation. You might think to yourself, that seems to work pretty well. We do that all the time. Why don't we order everything that way? Why do we need government? Why have any government? We can just have all of our interactions based on reputation. If you do something bad to me, I go and tell people. They don't interact with you anymore. You tend to be weeded out of the social group. You're ostracized. The threat of being ostracized supports cooperation within the group. Seems like it would work pretty well. And it does, but it only works well under rather specific conditions. And here are some of those conditions. The first condition that is required for this traditional reputation style folk theorem mechanism to operate is that play, interact in game theoretic terms, interaction must be, as I pointed to before, infinitely repeated. If you have a one-shot interaction with somebody, then the threat of being cut off from future trade with them from future gains is no threat at all. If you go to the restaurant and the restaurateur knows that you're never going to come back and furthermore that you are unable to communicate the fact that he cheated you to anybody else, he has no incentive if he is a... Can we get this? There we go, thank you. He has no incentive if he's a rationally self-interested actor to not cheat you. 
The reputation thing, what reputation refers to is, it's a story about all of the past interactions that you've had, and we're going to condition our behavior with you today based on all of the potential future interactions with you we're going to have. But if you don't have future interactions, you don't care. One shot interaction. The guy cheats you, he goes home, he doesn't plan on interacting with you again. So you have to have repeated play. Most of the time we do have repeated play, but not all the time. How many of you have been to a restaurant one time in your life with no intent of ever going back, even if it was okay? A fair proportion of you. That's one shot interaction. Okay, the second condition required for folk theorem type mechanisms to work is low time preference. You have to be patient. If people are impatient, if they have a high time preference, if they discount the future heavily, then this mechanism won't work. And the reason is simple. Remember that the reason, according to the folk theorem, that you're going to cooperate today is that if you cheat today, you'll be cut off from the discounted sum of all of the future revenues that your interaction with them would have generated. The restaurateur says, you're never going to, you, all of the times that you would have come back, I'm not going to get that revenue anymore if I cheat you. But if he values the future, if he's impatient, if he values the future very little, then that isn't worth very much to him. He values the present much more highly. So the amount that he cheats you is worth a lot to him because it's in the present. And the amount that he foregoes by cheating you, which is in the future, is worth very little to him. That means that when he does the cost-benefit calculation, even though he's going to lose all of your future revenue, since that's worth little to him because he discounts it because it's in the future, he's going to cheat you today. So you have to have patient people. How many of you are impatient? Me too. That's a constraint on this. That, that, that undermines the ability of reputation alone to function. Another requirement is that you have to have low cost communication, at least for the multilateral punishment thing I talked about a moment ago to work. If you, it may be, for example, that the threat of you cutting off the cheater from future interactions is only tiny. You are only going to come there five more times. So the guy thinks to himself, the cheater, the restaurateur in this case, thinks, okay, I discount the future pretty heavily. That guy was only going to come there five times, so I'm going to cheat him. Now, if, even with, that relative, even with that modest discount rate, if you were able to go and tell a million of your friends, even if he discounts the future relatively highly, he may think, gosh, I'm going to lose business from tons of people, so it's not worth cheating. But if you can't communicate with anybody, if you can't say, Jim Bob's restaurant, that's no good, he cheats you, then that mechanism doesn't work. So you have to be able to tell people, a large number of people, about the cheater's past history. You have to be able to spread the reputation. That becomes harder as the population of individuals involved grows larger. If you can only tell 1%, if you can only tell 1 one-hundredth of 1% of the population in which you live that Jim Bob is a cheater, even if that's a decent number of people, since 99.999% of the population doesn't know, Jim Bob may still find it profitable to cheat you. So large population size undermines reputation. That should begin to get the wheels thinking about the hard case that I talked about before and why it is that economists, even though they recognize that in small groups in which people are socially closed, which I'm going to talk about in a second, reputation can work, in large groups it tends to break down. Why does diversity matter? Large population size is a problem, so is diversity according to the conventional wisdom. Diversity matters because it's harder to communicate to people when they are different from you. Think about it in the most basic sense as someone who speaks a different language and you don't know their language. This is a crude way to think about it, but it gives you the intuition. It's harder to communicate the identity of Jim Bob to somebody who speaks Swahili if you don't speak Swahili. Furthermore, diversity means that there are different ideas instead of common ideas about what constitutes uncooperative behavior. Not all forms of cheating are as clear cut as Jim Bob giving you the flank steak when you ordered the filet. Maybe you ordered the filet and you expected the filet to come within 30 minutes to an hour. That was an implicit part of the contract. By the way, why don't, we don't actually have written contracts along these lines, unless you've been to a restaurant that I haven't been to. Why don't we have them? It's an economic one. Why don't we have, don't you want to write down all the details? Yeah, it's costly, right? 
The costliness of contracts is the very reason why you can't often use government to enforce contracts. Because the contract only lists a few things. So when you give it to the judge, and the dispute is about what I'm about to talk about, for example, the time in which the meal was delivered, and that was not explicitly contracted for, the judge says, well, I don't know what the deal was. I don't know if he cheated you or not. The, the, you thought, you say you expected the filet to come in 30 minutes to an hour. It came three hours later. You might think, Jim Bob defrauded me. I, want, I contracted for filet within 30 to an hour, not filet within 30 to three years. Right? That fact means that it's hard for the government to enforce the contract. You have to rely on something else, this private ordering to enforce the contract. Norms normally. The problem is this. If, you, if your norm says something like, when I order filet at a restaurant, it means filet in 30 to an hour. But somebody else in a socially diverse population, they have different concepts and ideas about cheating, thinks, no, it should come in three hours to five hours. Then when you go, Jim Bob gives you your, your steak four hours later. You go, Jim Bob cheated me. And then you go to tell this other guy in the population to spread the word so he can cut Jim Bob off too to make reputation work. And he goes, what was the problem? And you say, he brought me the filet. And they go, okay, yeah, that was part of what it was supposed to involve. And then you say, and he brought it to me four hours later. And they go, yep, four hours, pretty good. Their idea about what was cheating in that context is different from yours. In their mind, Jim Bob didn't cheat you. That's what they expect. So they're not going to be willing to punish Jim Bob or to tell others that Jim Bob is a charlatan. Only you are. So without common ideas, with social diversity, when there aren't common ideas about cheating, reputation can be undermined. The other, what time do I go to? Anybody know? Okay, I'm going to, I have to speed up. The other thing the other case, which I'll gloss over these quickly, but I want to talk about equal strength. The other case in which reputation doesn't work, <clears throat> a limit on it, <clears throat> is when there are people with very different strengths. So let's say Jim Bob is a beefy fellow, and you are like me, small and weak. <laughs> so you go to Jim Bob, and here's the nice thing about restaurants, right? Jim Bob brings you the steak first, and then you pay after. So he actually comes out, you order the filet, he brings you the flank steak, and he goes, 40 bucks for the filet. And you say, I got the flank steak, I'll give you 10. We'll call it even. You might think, right, what reputation requires is that if Jim Bob doesn't accept your 10, that you can go and tell everybody that Jim Bob was a cheater. But guess what? Jim Bob doesn't care since he's a beefy fellow. He can go, 10? No. Pfft. Knock you in the head, take your wallet, take out 40 bucks. His strength enables him to get from you what he wants, even if you threaten to tell on him to other people. Tattletailing doesn't work well when there's a bully. That's a way to think about it. That's another limit on reputation's ability to work. Okay, so what is the bottom line? The bottom line is that the easy, easy case of anarchy is easily satisfied. We have self-enforcing contracts. They operate all the time. They're indispensable to creating private order. It's all cases of private order. Government isn't involved. But alone, at least, they are very limited. They're limited to ensuring intra-group. Within a small, homogenous population, self-enforcing contracts of a very particular kind, when there aren't asymmetries of strength, there's infinitely repeated play, people are patient, and communication costs are low. That's a lot of things appended to it. So the conventional wisdom is correct. The conventional wisdom, remember from the previous slide, said this is possible, but basically so the hell what? It's possible, but since it only operates in a few cases, no big deal. So let's look at the hard case. The large case says, okay, let's take what we just said with the easy case and let's introduce the, fa the features into it that conventional wisdom says, cause it to break down, at least a few of those features. I'm going to focus on the two that are the most commonly discussed in the literature. Those two are large populations, which I talked about why that's a problem before, and social diversity, which I also talked about. Can you have complete... Remember in the case that we just talked about, government existed but you didn't use it because it was expensive. You didn't 
sue Jim Bob because it cost more, and you had another alternative means of enforcing the contract at your disposal, which was reputation. The mechanism I'm going to talk about now applies in the same context, but we're going to discuss it in the context of large populations and socially diverse populations. And that mechanism is we're going to take the reputation idea of the folk theorem, but we're going to add to that the concept of signaling. This, I'm going to argue, is sophisticated, at least relative to the unsophisticated mechanism of, contra of contract enforcement that we find with simple reputation. How does this work? Well, when there are large populations and when there are socially diverse populations, the problem, remember, is that it's hard to communicate to other people, or one of the main problems, is that it's hard to communicate to other people whether or not somebody has cheated you. But does that mean that private ordering is not possible in these contexts? It is possible in these contexts. I'm going to talk in a moment about the examples in the real world in which we observe it. How do individuals overcome it? They overcome it by coupling reputation with signaling. How does signaling work? Who knows how signaling works? Go for it. Uh, basically, uh, uh, one group, for example, gives a signal another group that uh, they are going to do a nice business in this area if this uh, first group enters to a new area. And I remember a couple of examples like uh, uh, when new traders come to a new area, they, for example, spend a lot of money and local charges or not make money somehow. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's right. The basic idea of a signal is that you can get people to engage in costly behaviors. Behaviors that cost more for some types of people than for other types of people. Education is the classic example of this, right? Why is it that getting a degree from MIT, or one of the reasons, why is it that getting a degree from MIT is so important to employers? Because getting a degree from MIT is really, really hard. Whether you're stupid or you're smart, the dollar cost of going to MIT is the same. But the actual cost of making it through the program is different. The cost of making it through the program is what I pay, plus the difficulty of getting decent grades in my past such that I'm able to graduate. For stupid people, that's harder than it is, that's more costly than it is for smart people. So if you have employers who are only able to imperfectly observe whether you're smart or stupid, they might want to look to whether or not you have a degree from MIT to indirectly communicate to them, since they can't directly observe it, whether or not you're the smart type or the stupid type. Degree from MIT means there's a smart type. The, the stupid guy found, would find it too costly to go to MIT. The smart guy finds it relatively cheap to go to MIT. Because of that, I can infer that only the smart people will go to MIT. So if I'm an employer, I will hire you if you're from MIT and I want smart employers, employees. That's the basic concept behind signaling. The same thing can work in contractual arrangements. Imagine that instead of smart people and stupid people, here are our two types. There are honest people and dishonest people. We can use the same reasoning. At your, there's honest people and dishonest people. You're the guy who's over here. There's potential traders coming up to you going, I want to buy your, I want to enter a credit agreement with you. I want you to make me a loan. And you're trying to figure out, I can't tell by looking at your face, are you honest or dishonest? Because even dishonest people smile and look nice. Right? So I'm thinking, how am I going to be able to figure out if you're honest or dishonest? Well, I can look to signals about your behavior. What kinds of things would an honest person do, only an honest person do, he would find cheap to do, that a dishonest person would find prohibitively costly to do? One thing that you might expect in the context of repeated play is that the honest person, if he finds it costly, if he's from a socially diverse population, imagine it's a guy who speaks a different language and has different customs from you, is that an honest guy would adopt your language and customs, whereas a dishonest guy wouldn't. Kind of like the church building example. Why is that? Anybody have an idea? Why would the honest guy be willing to invest in learning your language, figuring out your customs, adopting all that stuff, but the cheater would go, oh, if I, if I want to trade with Pete, I have to learn all of this crap, forget it, it's not worth it. The honest guy is future exactly. That's how we couple it with the folk theorem. The honest guy thinks, because remember, if the cheater guy comes in, the only way he gets to trade with me is if he adopts all my customs, which costs him a whole lot up front. He has to learn my language, he has to act like me, he has to get a supply and demand tattoo and say crazy anarchist things. And he's a status, so that's costly for him. Right? 
He's only going to do that, that investment in becoming like me, is only going to be worth it to him if he expects to be able to recoup that investment through repeated interactions with me that are profitable for him over time. But if I use a folk theorem type mechanism, and when he cheats me, I kick him out and I say, no more trading from you, then he invested in becoming like me, which cost him a lot. I kicked him out and he never recouped his investment. Raise your hand if that makes sense. So the only people who are willing to make the investment are the people who expect to be in it for the long haul. And the only people who expect to be in it for the long haul are the people who expect not, who expect not to be kicked out by me, to be boycotted by me. And the only people who expect not to be boycotted by me are the people who are honest. Because I will boycott the dishonest. This idea, I gave you a, the particular type of signaling I just described for you is what I call so, I've written about called social distance reducing signaling. But there are lots of other signals, costly things. Things that are more costly for the bad types to choose than the good types to choose. That in that context of asymmetric information, enable parties to realize whether or not you're good or bad and therefore to ensure that you only interact with the cooperative types and don't interact with the uncooperative types. Have you ever wondered why banks have marble floors? Have you ever noticed this? Not all banks. You walk in, they, they got the puppy decked out. There's marble, it looks like the Parthenon in there. There's columns, it's all fancy. Have you ever, do you, who values that? You know you're paying more for that, right? You pay more, implicitly, because the bank has to pay more to make it fancy inside. So why, if given that presumably most of you don't care because you spend about five seconds in the bank with the teller, why do they invest all that money? They invest all that money because they're trying to signal something to you about their type. I'm the good bank. I'm the only kind of bank that would find it profitable to invest in lots of marble that it will take me time to repay analytically, right, in our example, which means I expect to be around for a long time. A fly-by-night bank in which you put in your money and takes off ain't going to put in marble floors. Only a bank that expects to be in it for the long haul, that expects that you won't terminate them, boycott them, because they're honest, finds it profitable to invest in marble floors. Marble floors are a costly signal about their honesty. Signage. Look, look at this. Well, Coke Zero is new. Have you ever noticed how the labels on Coke bottles change all the time? Do you really care? Anybody ever change their purchase behavior based on the fact that the label looks different for Coke? I don't think so. That costs them money. You know, they have a guy who makes a lot of money, who sits down, a graphic designer. He makes a fancy label. They have to throw out all the old labels, produce new ones. They have to get a machine to do that. Fancy-ass signage on the front of stores. Do you really care? That costs them money. That's passed along to you. Why does that exist in a competitive environment? Because all of those behaviors, like the marble floors, like the social distance reducing signaling, are an attempt to communicate to you, I'm the good type. There's no arsenic in that Coke. Mmm. These are costly signals that, combined with reputation, facilitate cooperation even when people are different. Why does this work even when people are different? Because if, in fact, instead of relying on my ability to communicate to other people about you being dishonest, that's one way to filter out the bad apples. If I filter out the bad apples by saying, you have to jump over some hurdles in the first place to be able to interact with me, then the fact that I can't communicate to others doesn't matter for cooperation. I'm filtering out the bad apples ex ante with signaling as opposed to ex post with reputation. Does that make sense to everyone? What are some examples? I gave you some already. A classic example. This combo meal is how international trade historically and today is conducted. That 25% of world GDP that I pointed to. These international commercial contracts in the tens of millions of dollars for one contract Lots of scope for opportunism. Government isn't enforcing these contracts. How come the parties trust each other? They trust each other because of the possibility of reputation and the fact that they look to signals before they contract with somebody about that party's honesty. If you look to the medi medieval, tr international trade took off in the, tenth, in the tenth and, uh, late 10th, early 11th centuries. 
That's when there was the revival of, of, of international trade. And the way the traders facilitated conduct was by doing exactly the things that I pointed to. They didn't put marble floors in because there, were, they had no, there weren't banks that we're talking about. But what they did was they learned your language. They adopted your religion. They married your cousin. Those were all costly behaviors that only an honest type would engage in. And because they did that, the other party knew you were legit. That facilitated the, the contract enforcement. There are a whole bunch of other examples which I don't have time to go into, but here's a few. Okay, let's talk about the limits on this. The problem with combining the folk theorem with signaling is that this gives us a wider scope for private ordering. Private ordering works in a wider number of cases. I didn't exactly elaborate how, but take my word. Large pop this, this mechanism also works in the context of large populations. Again, because you're filtering ex ante instead of ex post. But it also confronts limits. One, you have to have some repeated play at some end. Remember, we're combining signaling with reputation. Reputation requires repeated play. Therefore, this combo meal requires repeated play. You also, because it requires the threat of just cutting somebody off from future trades, right? You no longer going to the bank. It requires that the bank is sufficiently patient, like we talked about before. It also requires equal strength. The guy can still club you over the head if he's stronger than you, even if you're signaling stuff. The other thing about this, which is also true about the, mech, the folk, simple folk theorem mechanism in the easy case, is that it can't create what I call encompassing social order. This system doesn't create laws, doesn't create rules. It kind of assumes that there's already ideas about what constitutes legitimate versus illegitimate behavior, and then it focuses on how we enforce those rules. But it doesn't create the rules itself. Where do the rules come from? That's another limit on it. Bottom line for the hard case. Instead of just facilitating private ordering between small homogenous groups, folk theorem plus signaling facilitates cooperation between groups, between people who are socially diverse when there are large numbers of them. The conventional wisdom, therefore, is mistaken. Conventional wisdom said the hard case, these two problems led self-ordering to fail for the reason, one reason that I just pointed to you, in principle, and there's evidence to this effect which we're not considering here, but some of these examples point to, show that it's wrong. You can, and we have, and we do, at the moment, have internet, have uh, cooperation between large heterogeneous groups, despite the absence of government, the most impressive, in my opinion, example being international commerce. Okay. Let's talk about... Oh, there's another hard case. I don't know if I have time for this. Okay, I forgot. There's another hard case. Remember that there were three... A well, few slides back, I pointed to three reasons, three potential problems that conventional wisdom suggests undermine social cooperation. We just talked about two. Large population, diverse population. The other, remember, was the guy being stronger than you and clubbing you over the head. Is it possible to have self-ordering when there are asymmetric strengths, when some people are stronger than others, in the presence of the prospect of violence? The answer is, empirically and theoretically, yes. Which is why the conventional wisdom is again wrong. Might doesn't always have to be right. I've written about this, but others have as well. One of the best examples, who's read Anderson and Hill's The Not-So-Wild Wild West? Those of you who haven't, I encourage you to read it. It's an awesome book. I focus in my own work on pirates, they focus on cowboys and the American West, and what they point out was, look, when you have the initial settlement, the migration in the American West, what happened was that the U.S. government didn't get out there as fast as the settlers did. So what did the settlers do? Did it devolve into a Hobbesian jungle and everybody was shanking each other? No. Instead, what you had happen was, the settlers created clubs. There was a property creating club. The land was unsettled. They literally created private clubs that established property rights, land titles to all various pieces of land that, inc that included private courts to arbitrate conflicts. By the way, in international trade, they used private courts to arbitrate conflicts. Historically, they used merchant courts. Today, does anybody know what kind of courts they use? Arbitration. Every international, nearly every international commercial contract says, in the event of a dispute, 
we're going to go to the International Chamber of Commerce, and we're going to pay them money to have a private judge arbitrate our dispute. Now, of course, the private judges, just like the judge, the private judge in the land club, has no formal power. If he says, Tim owes Sally 300 bucks, what makes Tim pay? It's not like he, the, the private judge can throw you in jail if you don't. He's not a government judge. The reason that you pay is because of reputation, the folk theorem that we talked about before. So you have land clubs in the American West. You also have wagon trails, which were the governance, private order and governance arrangements that they used for the actual migratory process of settling. The same thing with mining camps. Who's seen the HBO show Deadwood? It's a great show. It's completely fake. It's on HBO. That's the first indicator. <laughs> if you actually look at the evidence, which these guys consider in their book about the Deadwood mining camp, instead of being lawless and shoot them up, it was extremely orderly. These authors show that when you look at the data on violence and homicides, that it was nearly non-existent. It's not miraculous. It's not that the cowboys or the miners were angels either. It's that there were private governance arrangements that facilitated social order. Instead of public police, you had private police, so to speak. Instead of public judges, you had private judges. Anarchy, again, doesn't mean the absence of these things. It just means that they're provided on a marketplace. There are some problems, limits on the ability of these mechanisms, the club mechanisms, to facilitate social order in the presence of violence. One of them is that, one means you can use, by the way, to facilitate private order in the presence of violence, is to have response with violence. That's what a feud is about. Who's heard of the Hatfields and McCoys? The funny thing about the Hatfields and McCoys from an economic perspective, is that that's considered out of equilibrium behavior. The violent blood feud, instead of being an institution of violence, which is the way we think about it, is in fact an institution of peace and cooperation. Anybody have an idea why? What the feud says is that, if you look at me the wrong way, or you nick my sister with your fork at the dining table, I'm going to launch into a protracted conflict with you and your lineage until the end of time. <laughs> it's like going nuclear. Very costly. How do you think you would, you would behave in an environment in which the slightest transgression resulted in you and your lineage being exterminated? You'd be very, very careful. The threat that the feud system which is a private institution of order and considered again an institution of chaos and violence, actually produces cooperation and peace by virtue of the threat of the protracted feud. The problem is that most of the time that facilitates conflict, you walk very carefully, but every once in a while you stumble and you do nick somebody with the fork and when you accidentally nick somebody with the fork, you spark off a war that involves lots of violence between the families forever. You're out of equilibrium, and out of equilibrium, there's tons of violence. So when this particular type of private ordering fails, which is relatively rare, but when it fails, it's very costly to society. That's a limit. We don't like that. Ideally, we'd like cases in which if I accidentally trip, we don't all try and kill each other. Right? The feud, which is a way of attempting to create cooperation, has that feature to it. So do other forms of violent, uh, violent reprisal. Another way that you can, an even simpler way, right, which happened in the American West, was if somebody stole your cattle, what you would do is you went, there was a market for this, you would hire a basic cattle detective agency to locate your cattle, and those detectives carried guns, and they might shoot the perpetrator. That was another way of enforcing it. But we tend not to like that kind of thing, because we don't think it's a good idea to have private actors running around with guns. Why exactly, of course, is uncertain. We do f seem to feel okay when public actors run around with guns and do this. But private actors, we don't like it. So here are, there are some limitations with this as well. But the point is that, it, theoretically and empirically, you can, in fact, have social order in the presence of asymmetric strength. Okay, I want to now turn my attention to the hardest case. The hardest case, remember, was can we have, so we saw we can get self-enforcing contracts in the shadow of the state. Even outside the shadow of the state, we can have 
rules of social order and enforcement, some of which are violent, some of which are peaceful, some of which are signaling, some of which are reputation, that can facilitate social cooperation without government. But, what do we know about the American West? What do we know about pirates? Who's read David Friedman's paper on medieval Iceland? Only one person, a few people. You should all read that paper, 1979, Journal of Legal Studies paper, by David Friedman. He shows how you have encompassing social order emerging perfectly, uh, in, in, emerging privately in the context of medieval Iceland. The whole society was governed on mechanisms that I talked about. That's an example of how historically before government existed or was strong enough to effectively exist, we had ordered anarchy. But what do we know about, who wants to live in medieval Iceland? I don't even think the most hardcore of us wants to live in medieval Iceland, even though it was anarchic. Who wants to live in the American West? Probably not that many people. Why? Well, they were poor. Doesn't seem like a very nice life. So the hardest case says, isn't that a problem? Can you actually provide any theory or empirics to suggest that we can get ordered anarchy in a context in which we're not all eating dirt all the time? We need to go beyond what I call... Um, Oh, what I just forgot what I was going to say. Existence proofs. Just because something exists doesn't mean it's efficient. Which is a point I was trying to make yesterday during the round table. Just because it exists doesn't mean it's efficient. So just because these private ordering examples exist, it doesn't mean they're efficient. Okay, so what can we say about self-governance as efficiency? Is it possible to have private ordering that produces uh, wealth on the levels that we would like to see? Okay, the first thing that I want to say, this question is unresolved. I don't, I'm not claiming I have an answer. I am going to claim that there are good reasons to think that the answer is yes, we can have private ordering that does just as well, but it's an empirical question and there's more theoretical work needs to be done. But before I talk about that, I want to focus on first what doesn't shed light on the hard case, HCQ means the hard, hardest case question. Here are things that you are likely to hear from people when you talk about anarchy you suggest that maybe work as well, or even better than government. Here are things that people are likely to say that you should, rule, you should explain why they are nonsensical replies. First, well, every country in the world, except for Somalia, has government. Who's heard that before? What do you normally say? <laughs> okay, that's, step, that's sentence one. So... And then what you want to say, at least in my opinion, is what is that supposed to tell us about the efficiency of it? Every country in the world also has tariffs. Who in here thinks that tariffs are efficient? I don't think pretty much any reasonable person that you'll talk to, economist-wise, thinks that tariffs are efficient. And yet no one concludes from the universality of tariffs that therefore that must tell us something about the efficiency of those tariffs. So why is the omnipresence of government supposed to tell us something about the desirability of government. There's a little field called public choice, which I encourage you to look into if you haven't. And what that field tells us is that lots and lots and lots of stuff that government does is not efficient. It happens because it's in some people's interest, political rulers, it's in their interest to do certain things even though it depresses social welfare. That's our argument against, why do we say tariffs exist? Special interest groups, right? Concentrate benefits, disperse costs. This mantra should be familiar to most of you. You've got steel lobbyists who go, and they give politicians lots of money to get tariffs enacted. Even though we know tariffs make society in general, in general poorer, they make the steel producers richer. That's how we get them. Politicians care that the steel producer is willing to give more money and can give more votes than you can. Because you're just a regular guy or girl. That's how we get them. The same type of reasoning can explain why we have government everywhere. It doesn't require that it's efficient. So that doesn't help us. The second thing, which is equally common. Well, insert stateless society. Medieval Iceland was poor. Well, Somalia is poor. Well, pirates were poor. Well, I wouldn't want to live in the American West. Neither would I. And yet that tells us absolutely nothing about what we're talking about. 
Why doesn't it tell us anything about what we're talking about? What's something about medieval Iceland that might make it not tell us anything about whether or not anarchy can generate prosperity? Any ideas? It's mi Who said it? It's medieval! Everybody. Everybody was poor! Comparing medieval Iceland to modern day United States is silly. It doesn't mean anything. What you might want to do, if you were interested in actually evaluating it empirically, would be to see how do countries that were in a similar situation at the same time, that faced the same technological constraints, for example, how did that organize with a state, how did their welfare relative to medieval Iceland's without government? That would be comparing what we call relevant alternatives. Not assume that people have a time machine in which you can launch forward hundreds of years and how do they fare. That doesn't tell us anything. So, telling us that the examples that we have involve people who are poor is not helpful. Telling us that private institutions can't facilitate large volumes of trade is also not helpful. The first reason it's not helpful is that it's wrong. A quarter of world GDP. I don't need to say anything else. The fourth thing that isn't helpful. Put in your favorite rich country. I like Switzerland, I always use it. Switzerland's government can clearly facilitate more social cooperation than putting your favorite anarchic society. I like Somalia. Switzerland's government can clearly facilitate more social cooperation than Somalia's system of private governance. Yup, it can. Want a cookie? Doesn't tell us anything. Why doesn't it tell us anything? It doesn't tell us anything for the reason that I alluded to in the development lecture and for the same reason that number two doesn't tell us anything. Unless Somalia has, or insert whatever stateless society you want, unless it has as its set of institutional choices, be like Switzerland or be like I am, this is not a relevant alternative. How many of you argue with your friends about the Industrial Revolution? What do they always say? Sweatshops, kids working. Kids working, that, which was true, of course. Here are there's um, resources coming in from the colony. They say that as well. What is our normal response, in particular to the kids working, for example? What do we know, related to this, about wages during the Industrial Revolution? Standards of living, let's say. How were they compared to today? Nothing. Crap. But how were they relative to what preceded them? Smiley face. They were better. That's why people were voluntarily entering the cities. That's our normal response. Of course they... These working conditions were horrible. Society wasn't wealthy enough yet to afford to not have to put little Timmy with the sickle in the field. That's why he lopped off his arm occasionally. Not a good situation. But better than the situation, excuse me, in the factory, better than the situation in which he has the sickle and he's in the field. Otherwise, his family wouldn't be choosing it. The point is that just because something is bad compared to what we are used to does not make it bad in general. It is bad relative to what? That's what we need to ask. Relative to what? Every good economist must always ask himself this question. This is efficient. This is good. This is wealth. Relative to what? Relative to Switzerland for Somalia is like talking about comparing Industrial Revolution working conditions relative to today's working conditions. That wasn't an option for anyone. The budget constraint looked different because we were at a different point in time. Okay. So we need to look at relevant alternatives. So what are we left with? I want to focus in particular on the hardest case question. The first thing that we're left with is the idea, oh, before I say that, closely related to the point I was making just a moment ago. You could imagine the following. You should, what you should do when thinking about this relative to what idea is to think about something that I talked about in the development lecture, which is the idea of first best, second best, third best, and so on. Right? So first best government would be like an ideal government that did exactly what limited government people wanted to do for us. Right? So let's call that, it's not really, but let's call it, you know, something like the United States. That's first best. First best anarchy, we don't know what that looks like. 
We don't know what that looks like. That might be something like anarchy that exists in a culture in which people tend to be pretty peaceable, for example. In which norms tend to support cooperation, for example. In which strength asymmetries are minimal, for example, which gives less scope for the strong guy to club the weak guy. I don't know. I'm just coming up with these off the top of my head. But it's going to have certain features. There's going to be an ideal version of this, just like there's an ideal version of government. What you want to do is to compare these things. If you're interested in comparing first best and say, well, what would anarchy in the United States, given all of our constraints, which are less constrained than they might be in Somalia, for example, for a host of reasons, because of cultural reasons, wealth reasons, and so on, how do those things fare? Then you might want to think about, well, deviations from the ideal. Second best, well, what if you have a government that's mostly limited, but sometimes engages in predation? It violates its constitution, it runs roughshod over citizens' rights occasionally, so on. And what would a second best anarchy look like? An anarchy in which people are more, more disposed to be violent toward each other, in which they face more constraints, and so on, all the way down. What you don't ever want to do, which is what most people do, is they do comparisons that look like this. Somalia, let me put forward for you, is nothing like a first best anarchy. Does anyone here honestly think that if we were to have anarchy in the United States, regardless of what you think that would look like, that it would look like what it looks like in Somalia? Here's a hint. If you've looked at how anarchy actually works in Somalia, Chris has written papers on this that discusses the particular institutions, institutions related in religious beliefs that most Americans don't have, those wouldn't exist in the U.S. It would be different. That's one example of a constraint that's different. The point is that you can't compare across these things. You have to compare first best with first best, second best with second best, and so on down the road. Here's another important point. Even if, and this isn't if, we don't know, this is an empirical question, but even if first best government trumps first best anarchy, so a limited government, let's say, produces more wealth, more prosperity, more all the good stuff that we like, than even an ideal anarchy would, that does not mean much of anything. Because it doesn't mean that, therefore, second best government also defeats second best anarchy. And that doesn't mean that third best government defeats third best anarchy. First could defeat first here, second could defeat second there, and they could switch along the road. Does that make sense to everyone? That's really important because of a fact that I pointed to in one of my introductory slides. Where does most of the world live on this spectrum? Are they closer to this, or are they closer to nth best? They're closer to nth best. They're somewhere way the hell down here, remember? More than half of the world's countries, more than half. The majority of the world's, if you think about government as a grand social experiment for producing social order, what the existing evidence tells us is that most of those experiments failed. They did very bad things, didn't work out, not a success. The incredible success of a select handful, of which we are fortunate to live in, oftentimes colors our view, and we pretend and think that that's the way that government must be elsewhere. When people wring their hands about anarchy in Somalia, and they say we must have a government, they don't imagine we must have a government like they have, like Somalia had before, or like the governments that surround Somalia has. They imagine, let's have a U.S. government. Nice. That may be the best thing for Somalia. That's first best thinking. You could be totally right. It's also totally irrelevant. Just like the time machine idea. Not an option in their opportunity set. So if most of the world's countries are somewhere down here, then this comparison might be fun for you to do. But if you care about reality, you need to focus your attention on this comparison. Nth best government and nth best anarchy. How do those things compare? Because it's going to be different from up here. And the available evidence that we have, which is why I think it sheds light on the hardest case question, suggests that nth best anarchy trumps, creates more wealth than nth best government. How can I say that? I couldn't get the table in to fit into the slide. But I will tell you the basic evidence. If you look at the one case that we have of anarchy in the modern developing world, a, govern, a country that falls into those that more than 50, that greater than 50% of weak and, failed, weak and failed states that I talked about before. It's 
are typical of a developing country in many ways, except for the fact that it doesn't have a government. If you look at available development indicators in that country, Somalia, pre and post anarchy, what do you find? You find that on nearly every available indicator, development welfare has improved in Somalia under anarchy compared to under government. Kind of surprising depending upon your view. Not surprising if you're a realist and you recognize that that's not a very high bar to pass. The Bari regime in Somalia was not a nice one. It involves systematic slaughter and expropriation and oppression of the population. It's not hard to think that almost anything else would be better than that. And lo and behold it is, including nothing at all. This is really important because, and by the way, if you look at Somalia and you compare it to its neighbors, countries that are very similar to it in Sub-Saharan Africa, that have governments, stateless Somalia outperforms on not all but many dimensions its neighboring countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that have governments. Those governments, by the way, are also in that greater than 50%. So if we can draw, if we can glean any broad lessons from this, what does it tell us? It tells us that, well, most of the world's governments hang on by a thread. That thread, by the way, is not domestically provided. That thread is a prop thread provided by the international community that fears the collapse of governments in those countries. The alternative to artificially propping them up is to let them go poof, which many people are afraid of. But if you believe in evidence, you shouldn't be afraid. Because at least the case that we have, what it suggests is that if you let those governments go poof, the resulting situation wouldn't be nice. We're in the best world, remember, don't compare it to the United States, don't compare it to Western Europe. Those are not options for them, I guarantee it. Read the history. But if you compare it to the relevant alternative, which is what they had before, they would be better off in this world. An argument for anarchy as an nth best for development. Since that is what the bulk of the world looks like, the hard case question should not be preoccupied with asking us, why aren't there any privately ordered societies that are wealthy? Instead, it should be asking, compared to the relevant institutional alternatives in this case, the nth best world, how does anarchy, how does private ordering fare? And there the evidence is quite strong. It fares very well. Okay. Hopefully, I made that point. Bottom line, when it comes to studying anarchy, there is much, much, much more work to do, both empirically and theoretically. I would encourage those of you who are interested to put your time into the empirical side. The basic idea, the Ricardian Law of Association, going back to Mises, is already there for you. Use that insight to try and understand how social cooperation is supported or isn't in the actual world. That involves looking at the evidence, figuring it out. How do they really do it? What are the mechanisms that fall into the categories I mentioned earlier or don't? Maybe they're totally different ones. It also suggests that what you need to do is to consider the public choice element when answering the hardest case question. That's to say what I said before about looking at the relevant alternatives. Just because markets fail, public choice showed us, Jim Buchanan told us, just because markets fail doesn't mean government can improve upon it. The government may fail worse. That lesson can be applied to thinking about governance in general. Just because Somalia is a bad place to live under anarchy, doesn't mean that Somalia with the government, the government that it was likely to actually have. Remember, if you took, a, if you have the distribution of governments in the world, the real world, and you put, and you had to pull randomly from that distribution, the odds are you would pull a government from that distribution that was down here rather than up here. So if you're just playing the odds, looks like this does pretty well. Mm -hmm. You need to think about government failure relative to market failure. The last point, which is just reiterating what I said before, which hopefully you're convinced of now, is that studying anarchy is not a luxury.
It's not something that we should put off. You often hear the claim, at least from the uh, ideological side. I'll distinguish between the normative and the positive here, the academic work and what we think about in terms of our worldview. Well, when we get to point X, then we can start thinking about how we could privatize the police. But we're nowhere near that yet, so let's not worry about it. Point well taken. We are nowhere near that yet. And yet, that is an incredibly myopic and misleading view. Because if you care about understanding most of the world, then you need to understand anarchy. Only if you have a very, very narrow vision that is only concerned with the wealthy country that you live in, should you only be, should you prolong the discussion, put off, excuse me, put off the discussion of anarchy. For the developing world, the discussion of anarchy needs to be now. And since that's most of the world, I would suggest that that's the most important thing that economists can be doing. I'll open it up to questions. Yes, sir. Yeah. Sure. Um, since you focused on so much, I'm kind of um, it seems to me to be a question of whether anarchy can actually exist. There, okay, so the question was, can anarchy actually exist? Is there not a tendency, in particular in the case of Somalia, to, to devolve or evolve, depending upon your view, towards a government? Uh, and second, can't, isn't it actually the case that in Somalia, what we have is a situation characterized by a, small number, a large number of small states that behave in a predatory fashion? I want to start with the second part of the question. What is your view of over the long term? Well, the thing about Somalia, right, is that the next few de decades from the time in which anarchy emerged has already passed. Okay, so we have to distinguish between two, two things. In the northern part, you have Puntland and Somaliland, which emerged right after uh, the Civil War. So those have been from day one. Those microstates, I'm going to call those microstates, in some sense they're not states, those might, for the reason I'm about to lay out, but those microstates are characterized, I have one, okay. We only have one minute. So those microstates are characterized by the fact that A, they do not have the power to tax, and B, they do not have the power to actually police their people. Are those states? You have guys who say I'm the ruler, but are, would you wanna, do you want to call those, I mean, remember my spectrum that I drew up before. It's unclear to me whether, in my mind, if you do not have the power to coercively tax, if, if my taxes are voluntary, I'm questioning to what extent it's a government. If you don't have the power to make me pay, I don't know to what extent. However, that's the northern part. The rest of the country, right, for 20 plus years now, has existed without any state at all. I would not call the competing warlords a state. I don't, it depends again on where you're going to draw the line on that spectrum. But to me, a state involves a monopoly, clearly there is not a monopoly, in a territory that is legitimized, clearly does not exist there. You have competition. With respect to the tendency of anarchy, in this particular context, in, uh, especially, to move towards a government, one of the things that we know is that, which is an interesting case about Somalia, civil war emerged, really nasty stuff happened for a couple of years, and then what you had was a kind of equilibrium power sharing. You had different private controlling groups that looked like this, that all kind of checked each other's power. There was zero tendency whatsoever towards centralization, none to speak of. Then what you have over the intervening years is an occasional exogenous shock which is provided by the international community in an attempt to establish a government. They would say, okay, here, here we go in Mogadishu, we're going to establish a government. What do you think that did to the equilibrium power sharing? All these guys started fighting each other to try and become the legitimized government that would be backed by the international community. These are the periods of time when you look at conflict in Somalia in which you observe, it looks like this, I don't know if you can all see this, And people are like, see, and in the newspapers, they're, they're terrible, right? Because this is when the reporting happens. See the chaos in anarchic Somalia? No. 
See the peace that Somalia actually had before you disturbed the equilibrium, which of course led to conflict that you observe here, and when you backed out, it went back to normal. And then you did it again, and it spiked up, and then you backed out, and it went back to normal. This is what has been characterized the Somali situation. I think most people's fear about anarchy devolving or evolving again into government, um, Somalia is an interesting case to consider because I think it's very strong evidence that suggests that at least in this instance, that doesn't happen. There's no tendency towards that in Somalia whatsoever. There's no centralization. With respect to warlords preying on people, I'm certain that there is some extortion that happens. There's no doubt about that. However, there's also a significant amount of competition that limits that behavior. People pay voluntarily because they can migrate to another area if they don't, if, if, uh, to another uh, clan in the area, protection from them, to be protected by these groups. Do they extract money? Sure they do. Is that state-like? Yes, it's theft. It's state-like in the same sense that a, that a mugger is, is, is state-like. But I don't think that we want to call a mugger a state. And for the same reason, I don't think we want to call these warlords states. Sorry I didn't leave more time for questions. Thank you.